Hello, I'm Dr. Sharon Cohen. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity entitled Looking Ahead, Integrating Emerging Therapies and Tools in Early Stage Alzheimer's Disease. Today's activity is brought to you by CME Outfitters, an award-winning accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide. Today's CME CE activity is also eligible for ABIM MOC points. So make sure you engage in today's event, answer polling questions, and provide your feedback. Once you complete today's program, be sure to provide your ABIM ID and birth date in the evaluation. CME Outfitters will submit your MOC points. You can also claim this activity as CME for MIPS Improvement Activity. As mentioned, I'm Sharon Cohen. I'm a behavioral neurologist and principal investigator at Toronto Memory Program in Canada. It's a pleasure to introduce our faculty tonight. I'd like to welcome my colleague, Dr. Mark Brody, principal investigator and president at Brain Matters Research in Delray Beach, Florida. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for joining us from Florida. Hi, Sharon. Hi, everybody. I would also like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Pierre Terrio, the director of the Banner Alzheimer's Institute and a research professor of psychiatry at the University of Arizona College of Medicine in Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome, Pierre. Thanks for joining us from Phoenix. Good to see you, Sharon, and hello to everybody. Great. Let me now review our learning objectives. Our first objective is to recognize the clinical presentation of early stage AD. Our second objective is to assess the safety and efficacy of emerging therapies and their potential role in the treatment of patients with early stage Alzheimer's disease. Our final objective is to integrate multimodal and biomarker strategies into the diagnostic process and to inform clinical decision-making. I want to start by getting you, our audience, involved. You should see an audience response question on your screen and you can vote now. I'm going to turn to Mark. Mark, what do you think about the results and what can you tell us about the prevalence of MCI and AD in the general population? Uh, I think, you know, 42% number three, 11 to 25%. Um, I think that's a ballpark, maybe under calling things uh, because as time goes by from 65, uh, there's going to be uh, geometric progression in the number of people as they age, since uh, that's one of the biggest risk factors. But it's 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 a surprising uh, percentage of people. Excellent. Yes, and in terms of underestimating, there are lots of challenges in diagnosing dementia. Uh, many individuals don't come forward either because they're not aware they have a problem or they're fearful about a problem that they're too acutely aware of. Uh, physicians are often not well equipped or comfortable making diagnoses, and we actually end up only diagnosing about 50% and often late, many years into their symptoms. So when we want to focus on early AD and trying to diagnose earlier, we think about the entire Alzheimer's spectrum where you have a, a very long continuum of disease from preclinical or presymptomatic disease right through to late stage dementia. And it's the MCI and mild AD dementia phase that are termed early AD. So Mark, can you tell us a little bit about how we could distinguish MCI from age-related cognitive change? In uh, age-related cognitive change, as people get older, um, you know, occasionally they'll make a bad decision or have, uh, you know, an error in judgment. Whereas uh, when we're looking at the MCI AD spectrum, that becomes uh, more prevalent. It's not an isolated event. Um, then when it comes to one of these uh, finances in particular, somebody may miss paying a check, but it's not a trend where they're bouncing checks or they can't reconcile their bank book. Um, they may forget uh, the, the day of the week or the season that happens to all of us once in a while. But when this is a, 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 a constant theme, then that's more of a, a marker of, for concern. Having uh, you know, conversations where there are people 
are having trouble finding a word that happens occasionally but when that really is going on uh in a persistent way that's also a little puff of smoke to be concerned and then of course short-term memory where people might be misplacing things um and normally you would find them or it happens occasionally uh or you forget a word and then it comes to you but when you're misplacing things and you can't find them and then you're not recalling conversations or events and they're just not coming back, that's a concern as well. Yes, thank you, Mark. And of course, these changes occur gradually. And as you're saying, we have to bear in mind what any one individual's baseline is. But when subtle changes arise, a little more forgetful, but one's still functioning well, this is the MCI stage where we're not actually becoming dependent, but we're not quite ourselves. Maybe I could ask Pierre, what is the value of early diagnosis? Are we just worrying people or is there some merit to diagnosing early? Yeah, thanks, Sharon. I'm a big proponent of, of finding out as soon as possible. If you've just diagnosed me with early Alzheimer's disease, my wife, Laura, and I are going to get in there to see you as quickly as possible to talk about, okay, now what? I want to help define my future care plan. I want Laura to understand sort of what she may be up against. Uh, we're going to pay much more attention to my overall uh, health care plan. And since we're may, we may be on the cusp of disease modifying therapies, time is my enemy and I would want to start one of those as soon as possible. And the, the graph makes a, a, a pretty compelling point. If we quote only delay the onset of symptoms by five years, we'll cut the number of symptomatic Alzheimer's patients in half. So uh, uh, go early. Yeah, I'm a big proponent uh, as well. And I find that people would rather know and put a label on what they have and get on with the business of dealing with it rather than searching from doctor to doctor and thinking it's all stress and something they're doing to themselves. So when you have somebody with uh, maybe mild symptoms, what, what are the key clinical features one would look for in MCI or AD dementia? Right, well, and so that we've got this Venn diagram uh, and people will have changes in their cognitive function, their, their ability to function on a day in, day out basis, their emotional or behavioral state, and, and sometimes neurological features, although often they're later. And so this Venn diagram is unique for each person and changes uniquely for each person over time, which is one of the reasons we love this kind of clinical work. Um, and so in terms of the, the, the clinical evaluation, I'm not gonna read the whole slide, but the point is the history is, is big. Uh, 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 how did that Venn diagram creep into view for this particular person? And how have things changed over time? And what's, what's the context? What's the educational attainment, the work attainment? Uh, how, how does this person play and love and what's different? What are the medical problems that could be contributing? Uh, uh, what about uh, substance use or, or other relevant habits? What about family history? Uh, then uh, um, your evaluation of me is going to include a mental status exam and objective cognitive testing of some kind, some straight up labs and at least uh, a structural imaging once. And then I'm not going to go through the, the kinds of things we might look for in a more atypical or unusual presentation, but atypicality, think early age of onset, rapid progression, prominent behavioral features early on prominent neurological features early on or Parkinsonism. So those are some things to keep in the background. Uh, in terms of, of in-clinic cognitive testing, uh, there is no standard. It's up to the practitioner to decide. You should hit these domains that are outlined here. But I want to point out the relatively recent AAN guidance that you use some kind of objective test. This is also the standard uh, uh, specified by Medicare. If, if for practitioners doing annual uh, wellness visits. Some kind of cognitive testing is supposed to be done. And just as an anecdote, we've partnered with our primary care docs uh, in the Banner Health System, and we agreed together on an objective test to use. And before we use it in these practices, we asked our, our colleagues, how many folks with dementia do you think you have? And across about 20 doctors, they said maybe two dozen. And after three months of doing objective testing, they said, uncle, uh, stop, <laughs> because we had identified hundreds of people 
who had uh, objective evidence of cognitive impairment. So here are some examples of tools. Many of you have heard, have heard of the mini mental state exam. Uh, there's the clock drawing. In primary care, the so-called mini cog is not a bad way to go. Uh, uh, please repeat these words after me. Uh, pony, quarter, orange. Good, hold on to those. I'll ask again in a minute. Now I want you to draw a clock, set the hands to 10 past two, for instance. Good, uh, then we'll take a look at the clock. Uh, and by the way, what were those three words? And, and that little test actually is, is quite informative. You know, here's some examples of clock drawings. I was joking with Sharon and Mark uh, earlier that when I play subway diagnosis with my trainees, meaning give me as little information as you can and see what I can do with it, I would pick the clock because that just tells you so much about somebody's cognitive state. Thank you, Pierre. I think that's uh, very, very helpful and uh, absolutely no substitute for some objective cognitive measures and there's, there's so much to choose from. Um, let's get our audience involved now with another question. Okay, Pierre, what do you think about the results here? Um, let, let's get those ones and twos uh, uh, thinking a little differently. It's not hard to uh, administer these tools and it's it's actually just amazing how much you learn, not only from the results, but from how the person does it. You know, is the clock uh, done very timidly and with a shaky hand uh, and so forth, or did they just knock it right off? Yeah, exactly. So interesting that there's a lot of variability and lots of room to, uh, to do a bit more. Uh, let's shift gears now. Let's talk about function. We've talked about cognition. But day-to-day -day functioning, you know, may be driven largely by cognitive skills, but there are other factors as well. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about functional change in dementia? And can you focus on early stage, MCI, mild AD dementia? What would we see? Well, functionally, um, the normal activities that people have, there starts to be um, some little holes that creep in, whether it's, you know, respect to hygiene, uh, bathing, shaving, having a shower normally, uh, getting dressed, um, the normal routine where they would, or people would go for a walk or exercise or prepare their own meals, things uh, uh, change. So these are, these are functional changes. And then there's instrumental changes. So, which we mentioned before, handling your own finances. Can you take your medications without supervision and do it correctly? Um, just general housekeeping around the house, cooking, using the telephone, keeping appointments, um, using technology that, um, that you've been able to use and now something has changed, you're having difficulty. Trouble with multitasking. These are all things that we uh, hone in on. Yeah, thank you. And, and if you look at a, scale, a staging scheme and focus on early AD, can you describe some of those stages? Right, so the first stage is no impairment, which is really uh, for us, helps us for um, preclinical trials in, in that the, the patient's not aware nor is the family. Um, and people are functioning well. That doesn't mean that latent to that, there may be um, some pathology brewing, but there's no overt symptoms. And e even in that group, sometimes people have some subjective memory loss as we move to two, very mild decline. Um, most people wouldn't notice, but the, the person uh, um, themselves may be aware that they're not uh, running on all cylinders compared to what they would think uh, normally. And then three is a mild decline where we're seeing some trouble with short-term memory and there's some functional deficits. And those are the ones that we talked about before. And now uh, people around them, especially family members, are starting to notice something's off. And then stage four is moderate decline where um, Acquaintances, people around them, people at work notice that someone's having a problem. There may be changes in behavior or mood. And that's kind of 
the, the spectrum of uh, early presentation and then things progress where people need uh, supervision, support, have difficulty with gait, and um, ultimately um, in people just decline uh, very rapidly. But we're honing in on those first four stages. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mark. So we've talked about clinical presentation, symptoms, cognitive assessment, functional changes. And now I'd like to look at pathophysiology, what's going on in the brain itself. Um, I'd like to show you a 3D animation that we created demonstrating the underlying pathobiology or some of the underlying pathobiology in Alzheimer's disease. Could we have that animation, please? Amyloid precursor protein, or APP, is a long transmembrane protein shown here. When metabolized through the non-amyloid forming pathway, alpha secretase cleaves APP in the middle of the amyloid beta domain, thus preventing formation of A-beta peptide. However, when APP is cleaved by beta secretase and then by gamma secretase, the amyloid beta peptide is released into the extracellular space. A beta peptide monomers then combine to form oligomers, then protofibrils, and as they continue to grow, they form insoluble A beta plaques that are characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. Tau is an essential protein that contributes to microtubule stability and intracellular trafficking. In Alzheimer's disease, hyperphosphorylation of tau interferes with its proper folding and its binding to microtubules. Misfolded tau proteins aggregate and form intracellular neurofibrillary tangles that are seen in Alzheimer's disease. So as you can see, amyloid and tau are two important actors in the underlying pathobiology of Alzheimer's disease. But Pierre, we know this disease is very complicated. And, and what are some of the other factors or some of the totality of factors that will determine whether someone actually develops Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, th th thanks, Sharon. Uh, this is what I call my slide from heck. <laughs> uh, 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 a, a resident and a colleague and I wrote a paper a while back to try to understand ourselves. So how is it that you, you can enter the Alzheimer's pathway from so many different directions and yet end up with a common pathological and clinical phenotype? So I'm Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I'll make the general points. If you look on the upper left, we, we go through life with our genetic makeup that can either make us more or less susceptible to Alzheimer's disease. It can go either way for early onset disease as well as late onset disease. Uh, the more head injury we have, the, uh, the, the more uh, we have risk. As Mark said, age is a huge risk factor. Um, it, it, it lifestyle or endogenous factors matter, how we eat and so forth. It, basically a heart healthy lifestyle is a brain healthy lifestyle. And there may be exogenous protective factors that we need to understand better. So each of us has this unique package of risk uh, increasing and risk reducing factors. But if I'm destined to get Alzheimer's disease, I hit this tipping point where a molecular cascade gets unleashed and, it, and for some people, it may be amyloid dysregulation early on, oxidative stress, apoptosis, stress responses start, but they fail, cell injury, and eventually cell death. And so, so you, you, you can start in different ways, but you end up with a, with a very common feature. And, you know, this business about uh, amyloid dysregulation seems to be a pretty major theme. Thank you, Pierre. It's Fascinating, and we've learned so much, and yet we still have a lot to learn. So I think we have to have great respect for, for this three-pound organ of ours, the brain. Let's let's move to the second learning objective now. Let's look at the safety and efficacy of emerging therapies and their potential role in the treatment of early AD. There's a number of investigational drugs for Alzheimer's disease currently in clinical trials. And and Mark, maybe you could set the stage. Why we've got some approved drugs? Where's the gap? Why why do we need new therapies? Well, we have some uh, four drugs that are approved. They're symptomatic treatments in that they may help symptoms early on um, a, a little bit for a little while. So there's a window of time where these medications like Aricept or Exelon, the pill in the patch, Razidine, 
and Namenda is the fourth one used for people who are further along. But those first three are cousins. They look the same chemically, work the same way. Some people tolerate one, not the other. And about 30 to 40% of the time early on, people could get a symptomatic bump where they're doing better for a while. So that's important. And they, even if you're not getting the symptomatic bump, we may be delaying the onset uh, of, of symptoms or the rate of progression. So I think these things are important. The gap, of course, is that these medications do nothing to amyloid or tau, which are what we just discussed about are, uh, is the, are the, it, it, the pathology of the disease. So we're not dealing directly with that. And that's really what we're going to talk about the future of trying to intervene. Thank you, Mark. Yes. Um, so you're quite right. Uh, we don't have disease modifying drugs approved yet. We have symptom treatments. Um, and um, uh, it's been an important trend over the last uh, decade and a half in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials to try and develop disease modifying drugs, not just more symptom treatments and to target disease early. And I think that's another gap as well that the approved drugs you mentioned, none of them have the formal indication for MCI due to AD, even though there's a lot of off-label prescribing there, but something for these very early stages uh, where people are still independent, but have the underlying pathobiology of Alzheimer's, we really have a gap there. Let's, uh, let's check in with our audience and see how closely our audience has been following news about uh, Alzheimer's drug development. Okay, oh, wow. fair enough, a very honest audience. I like that. And a third of you are absolutely correct. And half of you are extremely honest. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe correct as well. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me just say aducanumab is the correct answer. Uh, this is a, a monoclonal antibody that's anti-amyloid and has completed its pivotal phase three program. Uh, escitalopram is a serotonin uh, uh, reuptake. Uh, it's an SSRI approved for treatment of depression and anxiety in the general population and being studied in phase three for treatment of agitation in Alzheimer's disease. Mesitinib is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that modulates mast cell inflammation. If we turn to the current Alzheimer's drug development pipeline. This is a slide from Alzheimer's and Dementia with the lead author, Jeff Cummings. It's a fascinating slide. You can spend more time lingering over it at your leisure after this program. But um, I want to point out just a couple of things. There are over 100 compounds currently uh, in development for Alzheimer's disease. They are spread through all phases of development. Um, and about two thirds or more than two thirds of the compounds focus on disease modification, whereas less than one third focus on symptom improvement and multiple mechanisms of action are represented. So we don't just have amyloid and tau drugs, which you see red amyloid and the dark blue is tau, but we also have in yellow, a whole variety of compounds targeting inflammation and other colors representing other mechanisms of action. If we just zoom in on the phase three biologics right now, I want to point out there are five anti-amyloid approaches in phase three uh, without a canamab having completed phase three. And uh, this is really the fruition of an emphasis on the amyloid pathway. There has been this strong emphasis on the amyloid um, hypothesis really driving research over the past 15 years, such that we're now seeing compounds that haven't dropped out, make it to phase three. And uh, there were so many failures with anti-amyloid drugs that the, the hypothesis took a rather uh, um, harsh beating for a while. We wondered whether it would really lead to fruitful therapeutics. But Pierre, maybe you can describe for us what's uh, come about recently to encourage us that we are on the right path. Yeah, so I'll, uh, this slide focuses just on the, the, the phase three agency we're talking about of monoclonal antibodies uh, attacking different parts of the amyloid cascade. There's actually a lot lurking in this slide. Maybe we can come back to in the Q&A. What's lurking is each one has a sort of unique line of attack on the amyloid cascade. Uh, 
Um, uh, the studies were done differently. Some of the studies were done very early in the disease course. Some have been done later. Some agents are, are sort of looking across the spectrum because we don't know, you know, how, how early to go. So for instance, if you click to the second to last drug, pranazumab, it has failed uh, uh, in early Alzheimer's dementia, but it is in an exploratory kind of phase two study in a prevention study that we help lead um, in, in persons who are cognitively unimpaired and, ha and have an autosomal dominant Alzheimer's disease mutation. But let me go back to the real point of the slide. So as you heard just a moment ago, aducanumab is the farthest along and uh, is under review at the Food and Drug Administration for possible approval. We don't know what the FDA will decide. Uh, the uh, BAN 2401 is in phase three um, uh, in early AD dementia. And just about a week ago, the first person was enrolled in a preclinical program, unimpaired people with, with elevated uh, amyloid in the brain. Uh, so, you know, you're getting this, uh, we get into this sort of mixed story now, gantanarumab, uh, failed uh, in a prevention paradigm, failed in early AD dementia, but kind of got rejuvenated and it's back into uh, early AD trials in a phase three program at a different dose. Turns out dose probably matters. Solanezumab has failed pretty much everywhere. Uh, it is still being studied in, an, uh, in a academic led study and people with elevated amyloid in their brains and not impaired yet. Grenazumab, I talked about that. Grenazumab failed quite a while ago. So the devil's in the details. Yeah, it's uh, it's really very complicated and we don't want to throw out the baby with the bath water because maybe going earlier in the stage of disease and higher dose and a whole host of other things may make a difference as we're, we're, we're thinking that we're learning now. So um, let's turn to another 3D animation model where we can see how some of these phase three uh, anti-amyloid biologics act. Monoclonal antibodies have been designed to selectively target amyloid beta. As we saw earlier, a beta can exist as monomers, oligomers, soluble protofibrils, and insoluble fibrils or plaques. Aducanumab recognizes residues three to seven on the end terminus of the A-beta peptide, and it has a much greater affinity for larger aggregates, the protofibrils and insoluble plaques, than for monomers. Band 2401 binds to residues 1 to 16, which includes the region targeted by aducanumab. Band 2401 similarly shows greater affinity for A-beta aggregates than for monomers. Solanezumab, on the other hand, binds primarily to A-beta monomers. It binds to residues 16 to 26 in the central region of the A-beta peptide. Gantanarumab recognizes two epitopes on A-beta, residues 3 to 11 in the end terminus and 18 to 27 in the central region. Gantanarumab preferentially binds to oligomers and protofibrils over monomers, but has a greater affinity for monomers and small oligomers compared with aducanumab or BAN2401. Pierre, can you tell us a little bit more about the phase three program or results of the phase three program for aducanumab? Uh, sure, uh, and I wanna let people know that I did not participate in the trial myself, although our institute did. So there were two identical trials uh, conducted globally uh, for, for the phase three program, a gay engage and emerge. Uh, patients to be eligible had to have a diagnosis either of MCI due to Alzheimer's disease or mild Alzheimer's dementia with elevated brain A beta uh, documented. So both the biomarker and the clinical presentation. Uh, a low and a high dose were looked at versus placebo. These were monthly intravenous infusions. The primary outcome was the so-called clinical dementia relating, uh, rating sum of boxes uh, for the uninitiated. This is a kind of an interview and uh, um, uh, interview of informant and the patient and a little bit of objective assess assessment uh, of cognition and function. It's sort of a global estimate and it's often considered sort of clinically relevant by itself. Um, 
uh, interestingly, both trials were discontinued uh, uh, following a pre-specified futility analysis in March 2019. But then uh, it, it turned out after the fact that the assumptions underlying that futility plan turned out not to be correct. The plan assumed that, that both trials would behave the same way and there were, there were differences. And so a, a, as this all data all came in, it became clear that in fact, uh, the uh, eMERGE trial, uh, looking at the data before the cutoff, of course, uh, uh, showed positive results across the board at high dose uh, and relevant biomarker changes that kind of lined up in, in a way that you might hope for. Um, the results from the ENGAGE study were not positive, but uh, uh, exploratory analyses of the high dose folks, and there were fewer in that program, uh, supported the the uh, uh, the engaged trial results. So here here they here are the clinical outcomes. Uh, uh, I like sort of I like this percent change uh, 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 way of expressing things. I, I think you know, as a clinician, that's kind of how I think. Percent change on drug over the period of observation, eighteen months. <laughs> Uh, so focus on the high dose, the, the, the primary measure, uh, obviously significant, 22% drug placebo difference with a reduced sample size, mini mental uh, 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 showing uh, an effect of about 18%, the, the uh, objective cognitive test, the ADAS uh, showing a 27% effect. And frankly, for me, what's quite impressive is the difference on this uh, Alzheimer's disease cooperative study uh, functional scale showing a, a roughly a 40% difference. It, that's not something we ordinarily see and that, that actually caught my attention the most. In terms of adverse events, the one we talk about the most is so-called amyloid related imaging abnormalities, dash edema or dash hemorrhage, also sometimes thought of as vasogenic edema, aria E, this occurred uh, in, in a dose-related fashion and in relation to carriage of the APOE4 allele. Uh, and yet, uh, and I, I won't read the percentages here, uh, 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 but what was learned through the course of the study is you could kind of power through that. Uh, these uh, tended to remit uh, uh, after a while, and the majority of people who had aria e were able to resume uh, treatment. Uh, most of the time, these uh, the, these events were just MRI findings, not symptomatic. Uh, where symptomatic, you can see what some of the symptoms were. Uh, and then uh, uh, aria H uh, uh, also a little more likely to occur, but probably not uh, clinically significant in the same way. And then uh, uh, nasopharyngitis, uh, you know, uh, uh, was seen. Uh, equally and, and fall seen equally across the groups. So this is a kind of a, a bird's eye view of what the FDA is, is reviewing right now as we speak. Very exciting. Thank you, Pierre. Mark, could you just run through quickly, um, give us a couple of words about the other programs, the monoclonal antibody A-beta, anti-A-beta programs that are currently underway? I think we're both involved with this as as uh, well as added can map, but this is the uh, BAN 2401 study. It's a phase three trial. It's an international trial now. It's a monoclonal antibody that's pointed at the beta amyloid as well, given intravenously every two weeks. And uh, that is ongoing. Um, we will probably have a uh, uh, analysis of results by the end of 2023. And uh, a lot of people have been in the uh, double blind portion and they're starting to uh, flip into the open label extension where everybody gets the drug, they know it, the patients know it, and we know it. Um, and the primary outcome, uh, a goal we're, we've set for ourselves is once again, uh, the CDR sum of boxes, how are people doing um, with the help of uh, study partners giving us information. And Gantanarumab, do you want to say a few words about that? Yeah, there's a thousand people enrolling. I've been involved in this study for seven or eight years now. It's given sub-Q, also a monoclonal antibody to beta amyloid. 
and we found that uh, we really had to elevate the dose over the number of studies. There's an idea that if mon the monoclonal antibody is not peaking, but mo comes more slowly, the area under the curve is uh, more broad and the likelihood of the vasogenic edema is less. We're still waiting to see if that's true. Some of boxes, again, is the endpoint. In 2023, we hope we're going to have some more. Um, we'll get to some definitive answers. Thank you, Mark. Yes. So as we hold our breath to see if the first disease modifiers in Alzheimer's disease will be anti-amyloid compounds, um, there is more to Alzheimer's disease than amyloid, as uh, Pierre's slide from Heck illustrated, <laughs> and uh, Jeff Cummings' uh, uh, concentric circles. Um, let me start with you, Pierre. What, what are you excited about in the non-amyloid approaches that are in the pipeline? Well, before I answer that a little more directly, Sharon, I, I'd like to just point out that, that the, some of these other monoclonals that share with aducanumab, uh, the, 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 the finding that brain amyloid can be reduced is measured in a variety of ways. And one of the things that we forgot to mention is that for several of these monoclonals, including aducanumab, but others as well, um, late, uh, other downstream events seem to be mitigated. So there, there seems to be less tau burden. We're gonna start learning about measures of neurodegeneration, whether they change or neuroinflammation. So uh, we ourselves have been awarded a large NIH grant to approach this a little more directly. If we if we start an anti-amyloid therapy quite early before symptoms, can we preclude worsen, worsening of what we call the amyloid bloom? And can we pre preclude the development, for instance, of tau and tangled uh, uh, deposition? So big question, we don't know the answer. Uh, in terms of non-amyloid approaches, harking back to my slide from <laughs> heck, um, uh, uh, when you go back and look at it, if you have a sleepless night, you, you know, the, the smart women and men in the labs have identified therapeutic targets at almost level, at every level of that molecular cascade. So there are 100 agents being tested. I think, you know, generally people are pretty excited about the tau targeting therapies. Will they do anything? What one recently, just recently failed, but, but it's early days yet. Um, Antimicrobial, you know, antiviral and antibacterial agents are being looked at. Uh, Anti-inflammatory agents are being looked at. Uh, I wouldn't uh, give up the ghost that, uh, that there could be new symptomatic therapies as well, different approaches to, to, uh, to uh, cognition enhancement. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, Mark, uh, what would you add or subtract? Um, I think I'm, you know, I'm, come from uh, as a stroke neurologist. So when we look at what's going on in the brain, there's a lot of microvascular changes, even in what we call garden variety Alzheimer's disease within the hippocampus, the short-term uh, memory relay station. So that goes back to brain health and all the modifiable risk factors. But there's some interesting work with um, stem cells now, mesenchymal donor stem cells, <laughs> which doesn't regrow brain, but dramatically downregulates uh, inflammation. So that's been very uh, interesting. It's upstream oxidative stress. How can we mitigate that? And some things that are really exciting are um, neurostimulation. So there is a study, a group out of MIT, where you stimulate the brain optically, where these kind of funky sunglasses with uh, embedded LED lights that flash at 40 cycles per second, and at the same time you wear headphones that click at 40 cycles per second, and the brain runs on rhythm, and it turns out that that frequency tends in animal data to reduce the amount of uh, toxic amyloid that's actually produced. Um, that's an interesting idea, learning, hyper-learning with transcranial magnetic stimulation. Some of this seems like science fiction, but they're there are ongoing studies and there have been studies. So I think a lot of people uh, besides the traditional studies are looking at outside the box mechanism. Absolutely. I think that we need to be very grateful that we have so many different approaches for a complex disease and it may well be that we need 
multiple approaches given uh, any particular stage of disease we're trying to treat. Let's uh, turn to our third objective now. Let's talk about how we can integrate multimodal imaging and biomarker strategies into the clinical diagnostic process and inform decision-making in Alzheimer's. We've talked about clinical presentation. We've talked about underlying pathobiology to some degree. Um, and uh, we know that biomarkers have become increasingly important in clinical trials, but in clinical practice, this trend will continue. Biomarkers have the capability of allowing us to be more certain that we're dealing with Alzheimer's disease. Cognitive tests can point us to a syndrome. Biomarkers can point us to an underlying pathology. They can help us go earlier. They can help sort out multiple comorbidities and head scratching cases and say there is amyloid there or there is not when the clinical presentation is very confusing. Um, and um, so maybe I could turn to Pierre to tell us a little bit about the range of biomarkers, how you would use them, where and what stage they're useful at. The point of this slide is to illustrate the range of biomarkers that are available to help with diagnosis, uh, uh, track treatment response and so forth. Some of these are more relevant to research, some to will uh, are already relevant to practice and will become more so. So let's just start at 12 o'clock. We have uh, simple as well as very uh, elaborate ways of assessing cognition and function and we didn't even get into passive monitoring, things like that. Uh, uh, we all have access to a structural MRI and uh, the cognoscenti will know that we're getting better and better at looking, for instance, at hippocampal volume early on and using that as a clue as to whether this is Alzheimer-ish pathology, so very relevant in the clinic. Uh, uh, fMRI, uh, um, not, I would say not relevant in the clinic, but uh, it used in research to look at networks, uh, synaptic preservation. Uh, we've talked some already about uh, CSF uh, biomarkers. We'll talk more in a minute about blood biomarkers that are just blowing the lid off things. Uh, genetic risk is being better and better understood. Uh, not that relevant in the clinic, but always, always uh, uh, in the context of research. It's really remarkable to me that we can am, uh, uh, visualize amyloid and tau deposits in the living human brain with positron emission tomography. Uh, this technology is FDA approved in the United States, although not yet covered by insurance. And this big idea studies will help uh, inform clinical practice. And we can look at uh, how the brain is using fuel you know, or glucose, which is also quite relevant to understanding what's happening. So altogether, we got a lot of, a lot of toys to deploy. Um, of all, all the, the biomarkers you mentioned, uh, one of the favorites in uh, recent uh, studies over the last uh, 10 years, at least, in anti-amyloid trials is PET amyloid imaging. And this has been extremely helpful in making sure we have the right cohort, we have target engagement or um, effect on the, the target that we're hoping for. But um, Mark, maybe you can tell us about the evidence for use of PET imaging in clinical practice, even though at the moment it's cost and the fact that it's not easily covered by public funding uh, certainly puts uh, places an obstacle on its use. But, but is it useful in clinical decision making? It, it is. Um, and uh, as Pierre was alluding to, there were the ideas study and the, the premise would be that, that Medicare payers, but Medicare specifically, would underwrite uh, the cost or most of the cost of amyloid PET imaging in appropriate patients coming from psychiatrists and neurologists. And um, it helped validate the diagnosis and it also helped make distinctions about uh, other conditions that mimicked Alzheimer's. But I think the, the big takeaway is about 30% of the time, we revised our diagnosis based on the results of imaging. And um, it, it really helped us understand both uh, where the amyloid was building up and whether we could correlate that to what was going on clinically, uh, specifically what anatomical locations and what circuitry would be involved. 
and then the degree of amyloid load. Um, so there was a time where we would do the scan and we would draw an arbitrary line and say, you're amyloid PET positive or amyloid PET negative. And now we're, we're much better uh, quantifying the amount of amyloid and where it is. And uh, we're, we're much better at making more uh, precise um, decisions based on that. And so we also find people who we think have Alzheimer's but do not. And so it's been very helpful to try to validate our clinical impressions. And of course, we would need the, uh, an objective measure if, in fact, the target was amyloid. We'd have to show that it's there to begin with. And then we'd want to know what's happening over time when we give a treatment. Exactly. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Pierre, you mentioned we're coming back to blood, and I like that. Can you tell us what's exciting in blood-based biomarkers? Yeah, hold on to your hats, folks. This is right. a transformer field. I'll be very brief. Uh, publications literally just a few weeks ago, including uh, a lot of data from, uh, from our work, showing that, for instance, uh, just to pick PTAU 217 in the blood, looks to be as good as almost anything else for establishing the presence and extensive uh, extent of AD pathology in the brain. So uh, uh, ditto for uh, assessing uh, brain amyloid with, with plasma A beta 42 and 40, uh, neurodegeneration with neurofilament light, even neuroinflammation with something called GFAP. So not ready for the clinic yet, but but optimists are saying, you know, it could be two or three years away, maybe. So uh, it could be a total game changer. Exactly. Very, very exciting. So let's think about how approval of an anti-amyloid uh, treatment might impact the use of biomarkers. I mean, we are going to have uh, a drug, let's say, that's disease modifying. More and more people are going to want to find out whether they qualify for that treatment there'll be more pressure to obtain an amyloid test, either PET or CSF amyloid or blood-based biomarkers when those are validated. And uh, there'll be pressure to uh, scale up these technologies, uh, make the cost manageable. And um, the, the advent of a disease modifier coming to the market will also facilitate development of, of newer and uh, perhaps uh, more accessible less invasive biomarkers as well. We're gonna to turn to a case study now. This is about Mr. Smith. He's a 73 year old gentleman. He comes for his yearly checkup accompanied by his wife. After reviewing the conditions on his problem list, his wife mentions that she has concerns about his forgetfulness. Mr. Smith is quick to point out that he doesn't feel forgetfulness interferes with his activities. But after asking him whether he would allow his wife to elaborate, she does so, and she states that over the past year, our children and I have noticed that Mr. Smith often asks the same question repeatedly. He didn't used to do this. He doesn't seem to be paying attention to what I'm saying because he hardly ever remembers our conversations. And if I ask him to go pick up some things in town, he usually comes back empty handed or with only a few of the things I've asked him to get. He doesn't remember appointments, yet he has no difficulty with driving or with sense of direction, and he's still an excellent handyman. What should a healthcare provider do in this situation? Okay, great. Yeah. Pierre, do you want to comment? I do. You like what you're seeing? I do. Uh, I, I, I feel so validated that people <laughs> may be actually listening. Uh, so thank you, spot on. Yeah, that's great. I think that's the right, that's the answer I would have given. Yep. And, and we didn't fuss over this, but the MOCA, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, you know, in our world, it might be a better choice for somebody this early because it's, it's a little better suited to somebody who might have mild cognitive impairment. Uh, I, I don't think he has an associated decline. I suspect he'll have elevated amyloid and he'll meet uh, MCID to AD criteria probably. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the MMSC has a ceiling effect and has trouble dif differentiating normal aging from MCI from very mild mm -hmm. dementia, you know, in the, the 26 to 30 range. Uh, and the MOCA has a better spread at that uh, milder stage. 
So Mark, what are some of the key takeaways we can uh, um, offer our clinicians today? What should they be doing in their practice right now to offer their patients with memory problems the best care? Well, I think the I think the biggest thing that I that I would stress would be make an early accurate diagnosis. And so, um, as people get older, uh, I think uh, there's been a tendency with complaints about, uh, let's say, Bob's memory, and his wife Edith says, you know, there's this issue, where um, some practitioners will say, well. What do you expect? Bob's 82 or fill out a prescription pad and write a prescription for Aricept with really no further discussion until Bob gets to the pharmacy and says, what's this for? So I think that's really important um, to make an accurate diagnosis. And we're really, uh, we're really pretty good at that now. And um, you're giving somebody a diagnostic label of a progressive degenerative disease that at this point, until we have therapeutics, is fatal. So you don't, you know, when people come to me and they've been a couple other places, I say it's not, I don't, it's not that I don't believe anybody else. I just don't believe anybody else. So I think you have to be very fastidious about coming up with that diagnosis. Um, and uh, I'm sure all of us, none of us do this casually. We always look for things uh, that are fixable that maybe we've missed. So I, I think that's the point. Look for things that are fixable that somebody that we haven't looked at yet or that somebody's missed. Get to know your patient and the caregivers. Get to know their strengths and their weaknesses. And the push really is to make an accurate diagnosis. There are a number of lifestyle things, disease modification, that really come back to the things that we do for stroke and, and for cardiovascular disease. And you can stress that with people. Um, they can actually spend a lot more time being social and do mental activities and exercise. So those are the kind of things, but I think making an early accurate diagnosis is, is uh, first and foremost. That's great. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mark. Let's wrap up by reviewing some SMART goals that everyone can carry into their practice. We really want to take memory problems seriously. You can't just eyeball a person and say, yes, you've got a disease or no, you don't. You need to screen with a history and cognitive testing. Then you need to take a tiered approach to diagnostic investigations, depending on what the story stand, sounds like, but also some routine blood work some, uh, you know, uh, structural imaging, let's say MRI, rule out things, but also then some tiered approach to rule in Alzheimer's or whatever else specifically you might think you're dealing with. If you think you're dealing with Alzheimer's disease, intervene early. There are symptomatic treatments. We hope to have much more substantial treatments in the near future. Monitor disease. Don't just write a prescription and send someone off. You want to follow them because if they do have a progressive disease like Alzheimer's, it will change over, the over time and the patient and family needs will change. And along that line, patient and family support and education are equally important to the medications. So there are a lot of questions now. Pierre, I'm going to toss this one to you. What tau-targeted therapies are furthest along in clinical trials? I, I would say uh, antibodies uh, to ch chiefly to try to interfere with um, uh, tau spread between or within cells. There, there is an oral agent uh, uh, in early development that would be it would be fabulous if it works out, but there's no proof of concept clinically yet. So the idea with the anti-tau antibodies is that we capture extracellular tau and try and prevent it from seeding the next cell and uh, being this prion-like uh, propagation. And um, it remains to be seen with several anti-tau programs ready to yield results in the next few years, whether that, that does the trick or whether we need to combine that with other therapies. Um, are supplements such as ginkgo or ginseng helpful or Prevagen or any supplements helpful? Mark, I'll toss that to you. Um, well, the short answer is no. Um, but we have done a lot of uh, studies, including DHA and fish oil and uh, different amino acids. 
uh, Prevagen has a good advertising budget. And I tell people that if they want to take it, I don't think it'll hurt them, but maybe consider uh, upping your donations to your favorite charity. When you have desperate diseases where people get worse, um, then there's a lot of uh, interesting people out there who are who can prey on people with things, um, a variety of things that we ha don't have any evidence that it's beneficial. Sharon, could I elaborate a little bit? Yes, please do, Pierre. So uh, uh, Ginkgo, for example, Lon Schneider and I were co-PIs of the largest Ginkgo trial that was ever done and showed absolutely no benefit. Uh, uh, so, so trials have not supported uh, it use. Um, and, and like Mark, we've been involved in many, many of the supplement studies, none of which have shown significant clinical benefit. And post-marketing studies actually raise the question of unintended harm. But maybe most of all, what I would want people to hear is that brain, uh, uh, nutritional experts in brain health all say the same thing. So, Supplements are not likely to make a difference. It's your dietary pattern and the, the paradigm of a health, a, a, a brain healthy diet is a heart healthy diet. Yes, I think that's been uh, demonstrated over and over and yet a surprising number of individuals are resorting to supplements. And I think that speaks to Mark's comment that, you know, you get a little desperate with a disease where we don't have a substantial treatment to offer. So um, I always think that, uh, you know, if people want to take supplements as, not, as long as they're not ones that are going to do harm, I don't, I don't fight with them too much. <laughs> um, yeah. But at later stages of disease, when loved ones are forcing a whole lot of supplements down somebody who's resistive to taking medication, then you really need to, to think twice about what you're doing. Um, there's a question specifically for you, Dr. Terrio. Pierre, do you know if you can get reimbursement from Medicare for annual AD screening? Well, I'm not a, I'm not a billing expert, so um, others may want to chime in. But so uh, it, um, uh, after 65, you can do a welcome to Medicare visit. And then after that, an annual wellness visit, which is enhanced compensation to be a, do a more thorough evaluation. It does include cognitive assessment. There is a code and I just don't remember what it is. Also for a more comprehensive uh, evaluation of persons uh, with cognitive impairment, there may be others, but those are the two main ones that come to mind. And um, maybe I should stop there and not get into intricacies of, of, of coding and billing. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, there's, uh, there are so many great questions. I, I'll try and go a little faster. There's one question we really should cover, and that is the evidence for lifestyle modification. Can this improve memory in MCI specifically? Does anybody want to tackle that one? Uh, I don't know um, what Pierre would say, but I think there is reasonably good evidence that, um, that you may actually get some improvement, uh, increased cerebral blood flow, uh, brain-derived nerve growth factor, kind of plump up your hippocampus as opposed to uh, not exercising and not using the Mediterranean diet where you start to lose, you know, one, 1.5% 1 over the years as you get older. Um, and this is vascular health. So uh, I think the same things that as a, uh, when I was basically a stroke neurologist apply here. So we're talking about hypertension and smoking hypercholesterolemia um, in, in stroke prevention, because uh, unfortunately when people have strokes, now they're at higher risk, not only for uh, more strokes, but for dementia. A lot of the dementias can be mixed. They're not just kind of garden variety um, Alzheimer's. So these things being proactive for, you know, preventing head injuries is a little different than stroke, but we know that head injuries is a risk factor. Um, staying socially engaged, um, learning new things. These things are all important and we shouldn't lose track of the fact that there are things people can do to be proactive along with trying medications and of course be open to be involved in a clinical research trial. 
Yeah, thank you, Mark. So I think, you know, as, as you mentioned, lifestyle modification is a very broad concept. It, uh, you know, it, it covers the cognitive engagement, physical activity, stroke factor, um, this stroke risk factor modification, uh, restorative sleep, uh, managing anxiety, and on and on, dietary pattern. Uh, it's, it's been tricky to study, and yet there have been some uh, studies looking at uh, uh, cognitive health and uh, prevention. Uh, um, I don't know, Pierre, do you want to comment on the finger study or just give us some highlights? Of well, I, I think I would want people to know that we're, we're sort of this close to proving the point. You might not be able to bank on it yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if in a couple of years, Medicare... Uh, uh, provides support for silver sneak, uh, silver synapses, not just silver synapses. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's, okay. a, that, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. And I think, you know, many experts say that with lifestyle modification, you might reduce 30% of the risk, yep. Uh, yep. Can, to 30% risk reduction in Alzheimer's disease. So not 100%. There are lots of people with Alzheimer's disease who lived well, who were physically fit, who looked after themselves. So it's not it's not an absolute, but if you can reduce the risk, then so be it. Let, let's move on to some other, other questions. Um, there's a question here, compare Aricept to Aducanumab, dosage, how often to take. So we're talking about very, very different treatments here with Aricept being a symptomatic neurotransmitter-based treatment that comes in a tablet form that you take daily. Aducanumab is a, an anti-amyloid agent. It's a biologic given once a month by intravenous infusion and um, probably will be indicated or at least was studied and successful in its pivotal trial in early AD, again, MCI and mild AD dementia, whereas Aricept is a once a day medicine that's approved from mild to severe stage Alzheimer's disease dementia. So, so quite different, but if aducanumab is approved, it may well be used in individuals with mild Alzheimer's disease in conjunction with dimepazil. Uh, there's a question here about diabetes, type two diabetes. How, to what extent is that a risk factor? Does it contribute to inflammation in the brain? Does it lead to cognitive decline? Mark? Well, the, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, uh, type two diabetes is, is somewhat related to the control, um, not directly, but um, it kind of follows along in a mostly linear way. And it's about uh, oxidative uh, metabolism, uh, for the most part, and inflammation, and what happens to the vasculature, or the small vessels going into the hippocampus and the circuitry, where memory and synapses all start to meet together. And it's been interesting because uh, there have been some studies using uh, insulin uh, that has a number of properties where you, in, in, you intranasal insulin and uh, um, insulin-like drugs um, as therapeutics. But in general, in general terms, the better that you, someone who has type two, type two diabetes can get control, that would be helpful at, in modifying uh, the rate of progression or the time of presentation. It's a sophisticated question. I'll just add one more comment. Uh, insulin degrading enzyme is, is an alternative uh, amyloid metabolizer. So that plays into it as well. Yes, thank you, complicated. Uh, more to follow. Uh, there are a couple of questions here about cannabis uh, and CBT oil and what its role might be either in cognition or behavioral disturbance in Alzheimer's disease. Um, Pierre, do you want to tackle that, being our psychiatry uh, representative? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a hot topic. Uh, let me see if I can be concise. So there are some laboratory and animal studies that suggest possible anti-amyloid uh, uh, properties of, of cannabinoids that it's very hard to bridge that to the clinic and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't get excited about that. Um, uh, in terms of other indications, so there are a couple of very tiny trials uh, suggesting that various types of, of uh, cannabinoids can be helpful for agitation in late stage dementia. And in fact, um, 
the NIA just awarded a grant to uh, the, the Alzheimer's Clinical Trials Consortium to study uh, cannabis products uh, uh, in hospice eligible patients who are agitated and near death. I think that's su such a great idea. At our clinic, we have at least a hundred or so families using these products, asking us for our guidance and we can't give it to them. And so we're, we're, we're flying blind uh, and uh, we, we need to catch up with our patients and families. Maybe I'll skip the anecdotes of those hundred, but, but it's certainly, it's, it's out there and we need evidence to guide practice. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pierre. Uh, there are a number of questions about aducanumab, and maybe I'll try and tackle some of them all at once. Be I'm thrilled that people are enthusiastic and have been listening carefully. And yes, this may be approved by the FDA. We don't know. We won't know their decision. But um, uh, they have agreed, the FDA, to fast track review of the aducanumab phase three data. And they agreed to that in July. So that puts us somewhere around February, March that they may, if they decide to, approve aducanumab for clinical use. If approved, this would be for disease modification and almost certainly for the spectrum of AD that matches those in the clinical trials, phase three trials, so MCI and mild AD dementia, and most likely an amyloid test will be needed to go along with that. Um, there's some questions here about you know, who will prescribe it, when it will be available, what will it cost? I think we don't know the answers yet. Will this be a specialist drug? We don't know. Uh, there will need to be some specialized centers and some pathways to guide people to treatment and to um, assist with um, uh, uh, earlier diagnosis, because as I said, way back earlier this evening, we don't do that well with early diagnosis. We uh, tend to diagnose people after several years of being symptomatic. So there are a lot of system changes in our, in our healthcare programs that need to move along with having a, a new therapeutic. So stay tuned. We're eager to have, have answers to all of these questions, but we don't know everything yet. So Sharon, as I mentioned, while we were getting ready uh, for, for, for the homebound folks who are looking for things to do, uh, the FDA uh, is convening a so-called advisory committee, which is a very important step. It's a, it's a public hearing where experts are convened by the FDA to hear the story in detail and render an opinion to the FDA, which is non-binding, but frequently influential. That's Friday, November 6th, so that's right upon us. Yes, thank you. Absolutely important for people interested, tune in. Okay, there's a question that I think we should address. It looks at the other end of the spectrum. We've talked about early diagnosis, treat early. We have some symptom therapies. They're not perfect therapies. They're not hallelujah drugs, but they do help people uh, in the majority of cases. But the question reads like this, at what stage are Aricept and Namenda no longer helpful? Should they be discontinued at some point? Uh, Mark, can I get your take on that? Well, I, I can tell you what I do. Um, I I continue to treat people with a cholinergic and the mend as long as they're tolerating that when they're outpatients. Um, and if they're uh, managing relatively well in assisted living, I would continue that um, because it, there might be some benefit. But once uh, the disease gets more advanced or people go into memory care units, uh, oftentimes I stop them. I just don't think there's a, there's really much of a therapeutic benefit. Uh, I think everybody's different. Um, you know, Namenda, Mementine, uh, an NMD receptor antagonist is really uh, only approved for people with moderate to moderate to severe disease. It doesn't change cognition, but it tends to uh, keep people at home longer doing activities of daily living. And once they're not at home anymore in, in, a, in, a, in a memory uh, unit, I don't really see the point. Oh, people still get some sedation from that medication. So when they're outpatients and they're doing uh, relatively well, I continue. So Sharon, may I 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, so in my former life, for 20 years, I was the director of psychiatry at a 650-bed public long-term care facility. So we lived and breathed these issues on a day-in, day-out basis. I might differ with my colleague, Mark, in a couple of respects. Um, uh, withdrawal studies have actually shown worsening even after years of treatment. Uh, that, um, thinking, for instance, of the famous New England Journal article based on a study in England, the, the patients had been on denepazil long-term, the doctors and the family said, I don't think this is doing any good. And they were randomly assigned to placebo, ongoing denepazil, addition of memantine or substitution of memantine. One group fell off the cliff and that was the people who got placebo. That's matched by other withdrawal studies and it's matched by anecdotes. So what I would say is be aware of that, of those data. However, some people aren't deriving ongoing benefit and may even be getting harmed. It's okay to take a break if we monitor closely. And by closely, I mean over the first two, three weeks, because if, if, if they crash, uh, let's please restore it quickly. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. That hasn't been my experience, but once they go into, you know, once people go into a facility, and if you're not part of that staff, it's hard to, you know, as, a, as a kind of outpatient clinician to get a handle on that. So I think we've got two excellent clinicians with slightly different viewpoints. And I'll, I'll just put in my two cents. I'm very aware that in the days before we had uh, public uh, funding coverage for these drugs, um, if families felt or patients felt they weren't benefiting, we would stop the drugs because they were expensive. And that was what the, the patient wanted or family wanted. And we would often find more precipitous decline and end up going back on the medications. I'm not willing to do that kind of experiment anymore with my patients unless there are side effects or people are resistant to drugs in late stage disease or quality of life is, is so poor or limited that it's hard to conceive when still getting benefit. Um, but at the point of someone moving from home to a nursing home or a, a different residence, you're really challenging people with an adjustment that's very difficult with a fragile brain and stopping a medication that may be helping neurons work a little bit better seems like the wrong thing to do for me at the wrong time where you know you wouldn't you wouldn't stop an antihypertensive just because somebody's moving into a home but stopping a medicine that might just help them adjust a bit better to cognitive change or environmental change to me makes sense that you would continue so anyway obviously there's no right or wrong here but i think you have to take a hard look at each uh, specific case. Uh, let's move on to different uh, kinds of questions here. Um, there's a question about combination therapy. The field has been, I think, yearning, at least in the clinical trial realm, for combo therapy with the understanding that with other complex health problems, be it heart disease or cancer, a cocktail or progression of stage therapies is what we need. We've been a little bit slow in Alzheimer's disease, but not without some effort and, and more to come, I think, in terms of combo therapy. Um, Pierre, do you want to comment on any specific initiatives? Uh, well, not, well, sure. I mean, uh, uh, I and perhaps either or both of you participated in the, the JAMA paper that showed that the, the uh, administration of memantine on top of denepazil conferred additional benefit that was quite uh, uh, evident in, in the, the clinical outcomes. So that, that's an example. We, of course, co-administer psychotropics and cognition enhancers a lot. That we haven't, we haven't gotten into that at all, but neuropsychiatric features of these diseases are a very, very big deal even early on. So just make that point. In terms of experimental therapies, not a lot yet, but you could imagine combining anti-amyloid and anti-tau or having them done sequentially. There's even been an effort that's now abandoned to uh, do a study where a monoclonal was used for a couple of years to rinse the brain of, of amyloid and then start treatment with a, with a production inhibitor to try to see if you could stave off future regrowth of amyloid. That hasn't happened yet, but these things, these things will evolve. 
Yes, thank you. Yes, it's exciting. Um, there's a question here about the use of monoclonal antibodies in other forms of dementia. Um, Mark, are you aware of, of um, you know, in, in stroke-related dementia or Lewy body disease or FTD? Is there much happening there in terms of monoclonal antibody approaches? You know what? I'm not aware of uh, monoclonals in either Lewy body or FTD, although I have a limited scope here, maybe better at that. Although um, you, we are, are actually getting some use uh, in stroke acutely into arterial treatment with um, uh, stem cells. So um, I'm not sure um, I, I can really give you a good comment. I probably Pierre would be better. Yeah. Uh, no, no problem. I was just gonna say that in uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a, a sort of a model tauopathy, uh, there have been attempts with anti-tau monoclonal antibodies true, to right. treat this disease. Right. Um, not, not with a great deal of success yet, but you know, is that how early we went or the dose or the type, the specific type of uh, anti-tau antibody? Yep. We don't know. I, th I think it's an interesting area. Pierre, do you have something else to add there? Yeah, that, so just just a, 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 some trials in frontotemporal dementia is a bit large. Yep. Yeah, okay, excellent. And we have a question on a different topic. I think this is close to your heart, Pierre. It's about genetics, the genetics of, of Alzheimer's disease. Do you want to give us a, a snapshot? Sure, I'll do the midnight interns first. <laughs> um, uh, think about early onset disease versus late onset disease. Early onset Alzheimer's disease is, is mostly uh, caused by one of three misspellings of the genetic code mutations. Uh, by the way, all causing amyloid dysregulation uh, that virtually inevitably leads to the early onset of symptoms and pathology. Um, another form of early onset disease would be Down syndrome or, or trisomy 21 with, with overproduction of the amyloid precursor protein and amyloid pathology in the 30s, not always symptoms. For late onset, uh, the, the, the gorilla is APOE4, um, carriage of one allele of APOE4 will result in about a 300% increased risk of getting symptoms of the disease compared to somebody without an E4. And carriage of two copies will increase risk by 35 fold uh, of getting symptoms. On the other hand, carriage of APOE2 dramatically reduces risk. So, um, and then age matters. I don't want to dwell on this too long, but if, if I'm an APOE4 carrier, heterozygote or homozygote, and I survived 75 and beyond, my risk goes down. And we don't understand what's going on with that, uh, but we, we just published a paper uh, mapping this out in great detail. And then, then there are a variety of other uh, uh, risk factor or genetic uh, uh, associations that have been described mostly related to membrane stabilization, membrane function and inflammation that we don't fully understand. And probably these other genetic factors are sort of subtle and maybe you need multiple ones to hit the tipping point. But APOE is the biggie um, as Mark and, and Sharon know, which is why there are at least APO, eight APOE directed therapies in development. I'm so glad you mentioned that last point. Well, all of it, but yes, very exciting to think that we could maybe change somebody's APOE4 to act more like an APOE2 and not, uh, you know, propagate whatever it's triggering in the cascade, whether it's amyloid or. Yeah. Uh, fascinating, and I, I do believe that day will come. So stay tuned. That has great relevance for early disease, um, and for, for prevention, perhaps. But there's a question here uh, uh, regarding perhaps later stage disease. Maybe that's where it was intended to, to lie. What's the drug of choice in managing behavioral problems in patients with AD? And I just want to comment that, um, you know, we think of pacing, wandering, aggression, agitation, a sleep-wake reversal, all of these behavioral changes being very, very challenging for patient and for family or uh, professional caregivers and they do require attention and treatment, whether it's pharmacologic or environmental or both. 
But just to bring us back to our topic of the day, early AD, anxiety, depression, apathy, these are the common behavioral changes. They're not seen in everybody, but certainly one's sense that one is not at one's best, is not able to engage the way they used to, is a very scary situation. And there is a lot of need to pay attention to the behavioral symptoms in early AD. Anyway, going back to what I think the question is getting at, is there a drug of choice? How do you deal with the perhaps late stage problems, agitation, impulse control? What, Pierre, what do you do? And Mark, what do you do? Can I have an hour and a half? Oh, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> How about a minute? <laughs> I'll try to do it in less than a minute. Uh, play Sherlock Holmes and try to understand what the meaning of the behavior is. Is the person in pain, scared, too hot, too cold, can't see, can't hear? misses the, the daughter who went to Florida for the, for, for the winter. It's incredible how often uh, those factors actually are, are the issue and that person does not deserve to get a powerful psychotropic. Uh, I have led and been involved with most of the major trials of the psychotropics and the takeaway is, uh, uh, let's say for antipsychotics, um, uh, 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 out of the best trials, uh, uh, only one has shown, quote, efficacy at the price of great toxicity. We did the KDAD trial showing that the chance of helping somebody with severe agitation or psychosis with, uh, at all was very, very low, and the chance of harming them approached 80%. So drugs stink, uh, but, but uh, in a nutshell, uh, be sure they're on an FDA-approved uh, uh, anti-Alzheimer's agent, because that might help. Uh, we tend to use uh, SSRIs as a second line of defense and only consider antipsychotics when we're painted into a corner. A new drug called pinavanserin, and I've consulted the company and you can disclose that, well, I did disclose that, um, uh, has shown efficacy for psychosis related to Parkinson's disease and is under FDA review for psychosis with other dimensions as well. Terrific. Thank you. Very comprehensive, Pierre. And you did it in less than an hour. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, Mark, anything different you could add maybe for the anxiety, um, um, irritability that we see in early AD? What's your approach there? Yeah, I, I basically agree with uh, Pierre. I, I, SSRIs and a lot of people are helpful and sometimes um, ballpark uh, I have some choices for older um, agitated men. I, I try to uh, try to figure out if uh, people have more of an agitated state, an agitated depression. There's more anxiety than there is depression, and it helps me at least make my first choice. And whether it's a man or a woman, but I think it's it's really you have to judge the situation. And sometimes, even in early disease the behavioral component seems to be uh, more dramatic and out of context to the memory and cognitive decline. And, and that can be very problematic in that people function relatively well, they test relatively well, but uh, there's a lot of significant disruptive behaviors at home. Um, and that's pretty challenging. The atypical antipsychotics uh, have a, you know, they, they're not FDA approved for dementia and carry a black box warning for increased risk of stroke, heart attack, uh, diabetes, weight gain, premature death. And so that, that's a mouthful and you have to um, disclose that to people, but sometimes it can make the difference between somebody having to be imminently placed or get some control and have things settle down for a while. But you have to explain that to family members and you have to monitor them very carefully. Absolutely, thank you so much, both of you. So we're at the top of the hour. We've had fabulous questions. I thank the audience for terrific questions. I wish we could keep going because there's more good ones. Um, I, I want to remind people to receive CME or CE credit. Please click the evaluations tab to complete the post-test and print your certificate. And if you would like to claim this activity for CME for MIPS 
improvement activity, follow the steps described on this slide here. Again, thank you to my faculty, Pierre and Mark. It's a great discussion that we've had. We could go on. We're passionate about this area, and I, I love that the audience is right with us. Please check out our, our Alzheimer's Hub. It contains resources we've selected for you and for your patients. For example, you can see the interactive 3D model, and you can see uh, other, other videos and resources. So once again, I want to thank everybody for a great evening. It was really a pleasure sharing the evening with you. Thank Bye. you, Sharon. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, Pierre. Pleasure. Bye then. Bye-bye.